to the church family. And we want to invite you, Nigel, to come and open the Word of God. So thank you so much for coming. Look forward to what you have for us. Thank you. Well, it is super cool to be back at Riverbend Bible Church. I can't tell you what a joy it is uh, to return to this place. We have just sweet memories of 10 years of ministry here. Uh, we, we lived at the, in the Red Brick House for nine years, and uh, th- th- we just were a part of the history of this church that was just a sweet, rich time where God did awesome things. And uh, even in this room right here, lots of sweet memories of impact conferences, Sunday services where lives were being transformed by the Word of God. And uh, we look back on those days with sweet, sweet memories. And uh, to be back here now, can't tell you what a blessing it is and a joy. Some of you are sitting in the same seats that you were in way back then. <laughs> Randall, were you in the same seat? Oh, you switched. Did you switch just today because you knew I was going to say that? Okay, gotcha. <laughs> that is so funny. Uh, sweet friends here. Um, some of you have come to visit us. Uh, in California, and those have been uh, just really great times as well. I know this year uh, the Dempseys are coming. Uh, who else? Phil Henderson is coming. The Bensons are coming. So uh, this is an open invitation. If you ever want to come and visit California, uh, come stay with us. We have some room. We're real close to Disneyland and SeaWorld down south in San Diego and those kinds of places. So uh, an open welcome to you all. Uh, just, just great to, to see you all again. There's some new faces too, which is a joy. I, I'm on sabbatical, um, so we've been gone six years, which means I'm in my seventh year of ministry. But I'm going to help. I'm helping you, Matt, with with this. Okay? So Matt didn't ask me to do this. He didn't even know I was going to do this. But uh, we were in the practice at Faith Bible Church in the seventh year of ministry. Every seven years, uh, the church sends the pastors off on sabbatical. And, uh, and I think it's a little bit of a recognition of the fact that a pastor's job is intense and, and uh, takes a, a lot of effort. Um, our guys, our pastors, we have five full-time pastors, work something like 80 hours a week each. This crazy commitment to ministry. And so every seven years, they give us three months off. Can you believe that? But it comes with some goals. Uh, there's a little bit of rest. That's one. Uh, the other is ministry elsewhere. So we get to go other places and encourage churches and uh, meet pastors and so forth. And then thirdly is personal development. So uh, I get to go back in March and uh, do some courses and uh, visit some counseling centers and research those and so forth. So, so thankful for this opportunity. Uh, Matt is in his seventh year, by the way. So anyway, okay. So uh, just, you know, if you love him, you want to look after him, right? <laughs> Um, but anyway, so good to be here. Uh, we, we've been here for all of February. Just, you know, our parents are getting older, and, uh, and we've been away so long, we haven't been able to help them with just practical things in their lives. And so we wanted to come back and really invest. And so I helped my dad paint his garage roof. He's 80 years old. Can you believe it? He got up there with me. I was concerned that he might fall off. Uh, he didn't. Uh, but just trying to help him even prepare for the future, think about downsizing and Serena's parents too in Palmerston North. So doing that has been a special blessing and so thankful for the opportunity. Anyway, I want us to go to Malachi this morning. So grab your Bibles. Uh, There are some notes inside your bulletin, your newsletter. So grab those as well. They are extensive notes. Don't be too afraid by, you know, scared off by those. We'll get through pretty quickly. Uh, the, 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 the passage this morning, I want to take you to Malachi chapter 1 because I think it's a real encouragement to us to think about how God loves us. God loves us no matter what kind of attitude we have, uh, whether we're in a good part of our lives and walk with Christ, whether we're struggling, He loves us no matter what, and this passage reminds us of that. Maybe by way of introduction, I could tell you this. Last year, I turned 50. I know I look like I'm 40, but I turned 50, and, uh, and I got a little bit nostalgic, and so I pulled out a really old diary of mine that I had kept way back when I was 11 years old. I was 11 turning 12, 
And uh, usually I would start a diary at the beginning of the year and, and my effort would peter out sometime during the year. But this year, I think it was 1981, and I kept the diary for the whole 12 months. Can you believe that? Quite an effort for an 11-year-old. And, uh, and I wanted to share some of the entries with you. Is that okay? Now, I, I'm trusting you, though, that you'll be gracious towards me because some of these are a little embarrassing. And uh, my spelling is horrible. So, uh, but I'm going to put them up here on the screen for you and uh, just, just follow through here. And, and there's a reason for this. I'll, I'll tell you in a second here. But look at this. This is uh, March 12th, 1981. And I wrote this. Today I took my scrapbooks to school. The cover isn't fixed yet. I've been playing with my cricket ball at the intervals. It's bad spelling. I get it. I've been making a poster with a picture of a boat in it. It was really hard to draw. Dad is being ugly again. Weather warm, bedtime, 8.40. There's important details right at the end, right? <laughs> okay, there's just a week later, March 19th, this is what I wrote. Uh, today, Mr. Patel made us run around the field and then do a forward flip on the trampoline. But I couldn't do it, so he told me to do a forward roll but I couldn't do that either, so I just got off. <laughs> Dad is being ugly again. <laughs> Weather windy and cold, bedtime 9.05. There's a little trend here. You can see it, right, with my father. April 15th. Let me read this one to you. Our play went really neat, except we lost the cross, which was going to go on Jesus' back. Excuse the spelling, please. Uh, we'll be putting uh, the play on tomorrow in school time. No one can get some parts for my watch. Mum said if she buys another watch, it won't be a digital. I, apparently, digital watches were all a rave back then, and I wanted one, but she said no. And my comment is this, it isn't fair. Weather windy, bedtime 9.40. And then last entry, okay, here we go. This is July 28th. I asked Dad if I could buy an air riffle, that's a rifle. <laughs> he said, no, it isn't fair. I just want to be like the other boys. They've all got one. I've been to St. John's. We had an inspector there tonight. She wasn't very good. Weather warm, bedtime, <laughs> 9.25. Now, there's a trend here. You see it, right? And I'll summarize so you can kind of pick up on it. Number one, I said, it isn't fair. Number two, it isn't fair, I just want to be like the other boys. Number three, dad is being ugly again. And number four, dad is being ugly again, again. And I'm sorry to tell you, if you were to read uh, the rest of my journal, my diary for that year, it would pretty much say the same thing over and over and over again. My attitude was really bad. And as I read my diary, a picture was forming of a young boy who just felt entitled and deserving of a better life and wanted more. And when I didn't get it, I just got upset with the world, especially my dad, right? But here's the thing. I was loved. I was cared for. I was embraced. I was well-fed. I was warm. And I had more than most kids in the world. Amen? I just did. And yet here I was, instead of being grateful, I was spitting the dummy. I was upset, I was angry. Uh, that, that is not a good place to be in. And, uh, you know, when, when I preached this message back in the States, I had to explain the term spitting the dummy. But you get it. You know what that is. I was mad at the world, packing a sad, throwing a wobbly, and recording the whole thing in my diary to read later on. Now, the point is this, that same attitude is exactly where Israel is in the book of Malachi. They were blessed, they were loved by God, but they were throwing a wobbly. They were packing a sad, spitting the dummy, they thought they deserved more. And, and when we get to Malachi chapter 1, they're upset with God, and you've got to ask why why in the world are they upset? But that's exactly what they are. They're angry with God. So let's dig in, shall we? Go to Malachi, and I want to read the, the passage for us. It's just the first five verses, and this is a punchy passage. This is a, 
This is a serious passage, and, and you'll see why here in a second. So in your Bibles, look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. And this is how it reads. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. And I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins, thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Your eyes will see this, and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. It's an amazing passage. It's a shocking passage because Israel's attitude is just so, so bad. Now, what I want to do is give you a little summary here of what's happened uh, in the history of Israel so you can see what I'm talking about. At this point in time, Israel has been restored back to the promised land. They had been taken off to captivity into Babylon, and they suffered there for a season, but God has brought them back to the land now. The city of Jerusalem has been rebuilt, the temple has been rebuilt, and prosperity is returning, and the nation really is enjoying a season of freedom, and these are more comfortable days for Israel. And then you have this prophet come along, his name is Malachi, and uh, he is the, the last prophet of the Old Testament, and uh, he gives this prophecy, this word, this message from God recorded for us in the book of Malachi. This is how he starts. Look at verse 1 again. He says, the oracle, that's an interesting word, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. The word oracle, uh, we associate that with a company, even with the America's Cup sailing, right? Something like that. But oracle, actually, if you look at the word, it, 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 it implies a heavy burden. An oracle is a heavy message. Uh, and so the book of Malachi, then, is a really heavy duty message. If you're looking for a lightweight sermon this morning, you're not going to get it, okay? Because we have to be faithful to the text, Amen. It's a heavy message. And so Malachi brings this message. The first verse says that the, the heavy burden is from the Lord. It's, it's not for all the nations. It's just for Israel, the nation of Israel. And Malachi the prophet is the agent. He's, he's the messenger of this, this message. Then we get to the burden itself. So if you're looking at your notes, you can start filling in some gaps here and, uh, and track along with me. So first up, what we have is God's declaration, okay? God's declaration, and this is what God says in verse 2. God says, I have loved you. I have loved you, says the Lord. That's what it says, right? I have loved you, Israel. I, the creator of the universe, uh, the God, the holy and righteous judge, the God who can do whatever he pleases, I have chosen to love you, Israel. It's an amazing statement. You say, well, how did he love them? Let me give you some clues. First off, and we even read earlier from Genesis 22, a fantastic uh, reading there. This is how God loved Israel. Number one, he chose Abraham. God chose Abraham to be the father of this nation. He loved them by making Israel, the special chosen nation that he would bless. He would make promises to them of blessing and land and a kingdom and a future. He loved them. Think about this. He gave them a sacrificial system by which they could receive forgiveness for sins. That's love. 
God had loved them. He loved them by making himself available to this nation in a special relationship. And then if you track forward just a few years more recently in their history, God had loved them by allowing them to survive the Babylonian captivity and now be restored to the land. He's brought them back because previously he'd made them promises to be in the land and now they're back in the land. He's restored them and actually the nation is uh, thriving and doing really well. There's renewed religious life and social life. He has kept his promises to them. He's loved them. It's a real simple statement, but it has massive, massive implications. But here's the thing. Israel didn't see it. They didn't get it. They questioned God's love. They don't acknowledge it. In fact, they are even wondering if God is telling the truth. It's an interesting response. It's like they are children sitting on their father's lap, slapping him across the face. That's their response. Spitting the dummy, their response is so, so bad. So look at this here in verse 2 again. And this is Israel's denial, if you're tracking through the outline, Israel's denial. So the Lord says, I have loved you, and this is Israel's response. They say, how? How have you loved us? It's terrible, isn't it? How on earth could they dare to ask that question? What has happened in their hearts that they, that they would even speak those words? It's a terrible response. This is what had happened. The nation of Israel had become apathetic. They were complacent. They were comfortable. They were entitled. And instead of seeing themselves as blessed by God, they actually thought of themselves as equals with God, and they thought they could bargain with God to get a better life. They believed they weren't being treated the way they deserved, and so they questioned God's character. And so they throw this accusation back in God's face, and they slap him as if he doesn't care. How, how do you think that made God feel? God's got emotions, right? He's got feelings. He's loved them to the hilt, and they don't see it. Would have broken his heart. Listen, m many of you are parents, and uh, you know firsthand what it's like. You, you love your kids, you love them, you love them, you love them, and then one day they say, I hate you, Mum. Right? I hate you, Dad. How does that make you feel? Breaks your heart, right? That's exactly what Israel is doing to God. It's got to break his heart. So you say, well, how, how could they possibly say this to God? Well, let me challenge you. They do it exactly the same way we do it. We, we have the same response sometimes. Let me give you some examples. My wife complains like a dripping tap. Oh, not Serena, by the way. Okay. It's, it's just an illustration, okay? Just an illustration. My wife complains like a dripping tap. How, God, could you give me that wife? See how that's a complaint? We think we deserve better. My husband ignores me day after day after day. How could God give me that husband? Does he love me, really? Or, my boss just let me go. How could a loving God allow that to happen? Or, my investment was blown to smithereens and I've lost everything. I thought God was supposed to love me. Or, my car just broke down. And now I'm stranded. How come God doesn't love me today like he did yesterday when my car was fine? Or, my parents used to beat me. Where was God's love then? Or, I'm being persecuted unfairly. Where is God's love now? Or, my friends have abandoned me. How could God let that happen to me? 
or my child has cancer. How could a loving God allow that to happen to our family? And it's in moments like that that we realize that we're not that much different than Israel, right? And we start to question whether God loves us. Because we, at at the core, we really feel like we deserve better than that, don't we? We do. And so Israel then is being challenged by God here. They thought that they deserved his favor, his selection, and now they're doubting God's love. Look at verse 2 again here. Next, we see God's answer to their question. They they ask this question, and, and then God gives an answer. He gives a defense, and so that's point number three, God's defense. And it's a real surprise. I mean, look at this here. Israel says, how have you loved us, God? And the Lord answers, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? That's his answer. It's a shocking answer. It's not what you would expect. This is what God is saying. He's saying, there's Esau and Jacob. Weren't they the same? Weren't they equals? Didn't they have the same parents? And of course, the answer is what? Yeah, that's true. They were brothers. In fact, they were twin brothers. Exactly the same. And if you wanted to read the story, I recommend you do that. Genesis 25, you could pick that up maybe this afternoon. It's an amazing story. If you go there, what you'll find is that Abraham had a son. His name was Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, and they were Jacob and Esau. Now, you look at these four men, three generations, four men. They're all the same. They're all wicked men. They just are. Now, God did things in their lives and transformed their hearts and all that in three cases. But at the beginning, they were wicked men. Abraham was a Gentile. He was a liar. He was an adulterer. And yet, God chose him to be his special uh, father to a nation. And God did wonderful things through the life of Abraham. Isaac wasn't any better. But Isaac inherited the promises that God made to Abraham, not for any other reason than because God chose to do it through Isaac. Isaac was a sinner, just like his dad. And then came Jacob and Esau, and they were depraved sinners just like their forefathers. Neither of them was choice worthy. Neither of them was better than the other. You've got Jacob and Esau, twin brothers, Neither of them deserve to be loved by God. That's the whole point. And now here in Malachi, now think about this. Malachi, this is uh, 1,500 years after Abraham, okay? So 1,500 years of history. And, and, And Israel slapping God across the face saying, you don't love us. And God says, listen, I could just as easily have chosen Esau, you know. That's his answer. I didn't have to choose Jacob. I could have gone with Esau. They were brothers. Neither of them was better than the other. But I chose Jacob. I chose his lineage. Didn't have to, but I chose you, Israel. Doesn't that prove my love for you? Surely it does. And the Lord's defense is so amazing. Because here's the thing. Israel is apathetic. They're complaining. They're lazy. They're they're stingy with their offerings. They're really ungrateful people. And God's defense is to show them that he could have gone another way with the history of this nation. He could have chosen Esau. But in spite of their sin... He chose them. It's like, it's like an adopted child growing up and then claiming that his adopting or her adopting parents didn't love them. It's crazy. Sarita and I, uh, and some of you, we were in Uganda. Remember, some of you were on the team. We went to Uganda. We went to an orphanage in Jinja. Remember that? And there's these, these African kids and and 
and they're so sweet and so cute and they're waiting for parents to come in and choose them, basically is what it is. And, um, and Serena and I, we, we considered really seriously about whether we could pull off adopting uh, one or more of these children. We actually tried to figure it out with the government here in New Zealand and it just wouldn't work out. But imagine, a, a, a parent goes into this orphanage, chooses a child, brings that child into their home, loves them, cares for them, provides for that child, makes them a part of the family, and then the child grows up and says, you didn't love me. Can you imagine that? I was talking with the Hawkins the other night. I mean, what a great story that is. Roger and Daphne adopting these children. Can you imagine one of those children one day growing up and saying, you didn't love me. What a terrible, terrible attitude. And, and this is what Israel is saying to God. You don't love us. And here's the point. All God did was go into the orphanage and choose this one nation through Abraham. That's what he did. Love that nation. Love that lineage. And now they're turning around and accusing him of not loving them at all. It's a terrible, terrible attitude. God adopted them, and now they're questioning all of that. Now look here, look at verse 2 again. God says, even though Esau and Jacob were twin brothers, yet, he says, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Okay, time out, right? Let's we'll stop right there. What, what is this about? The sentence needs some explanation, and, and I get it. Because at first glance, when you read that, it just seems not quite fair. Right? This is not fair. Why was Jacob loved and Esau hated? It doesn't sound like they were treated with equal opportunity. It doesn't sound like they got a fair shake. So let me try to help. I'll give you three little things to think about as we process this. Number one, the, the first thing we must not do is attribute human emotions to God's actions. God doesn't love the way we do. God doesn't emote and feel the way we do. Uh, often when we choose to love and hate, it's often in response to the way we're being treated. That's our human nature. It's our sinful, fleshly ways coming through. But God doesn't operate that way. So don't think of God's choice in human terms of love and hate. It's not that at all. Secondly, the verbs love and hate must not be weakened down to mean something like more love and a lesser kind of love. Now, I know that love and hate is used in the New Testament in that kind of way regarding family. But here, in this passage, this is not two degrees of more love and a little less love. No, here, these are opposites. Love and hate are opposites. And we need to maintain that meaning here. Thirdly, God's choice to love Jacob is not at all a question of what Jacob deserved. It just isn't. He didn't deserve God's love. Neither of them did. It's not a question of Jacob being better than Esau because they were equals. They were brothers. He wasn't any better at all. If you want to talk about what Jacob and Esau really deserved, they both deserved what? Hell. From birth. Both of them. They both deserved God's judgment. Both sinners from conception both depraved from their beginning in the womb. And just like Abraham and Isaac before them, both would have been condemned to eternal death unless God stepped in. Amen? That's the whole point. So don't be thinking Esau missed out on something that he deserved, because he didn't. He, Esau actually got what he deserved. Eternal judgment. Conversely, you know what should amaze us? Is that Jacob got any love at all. That should amaze us. So don't be upset that God hated Esau. That's expected. God treated him just as he deserved. What should amaze us is that God loved a sinner like Jacob. 
that is an amazing thing. See, our problem is this. We are we're so prideful in our hearts, so entitled, and we don't, we don't understand our sinfulness enough to realize that this is what we deserve. We think that God should bless us. We think that God should be kind and good to us. Now, he's made promises for sure, for love and kindness, but we don't deserve those things. That's the point. None of us do. And often we're tempted to point a finger at God and say, well, that's not fair that you would treat that person that way. When you know what? It is absolutely fair that God would treat them that way. Someone mentions the word election. I know this church is solid and great preacher, a solid pulpit who have taught you on these things. But you can go some places and mention the word election and predestination, and people shudder, they shriek in anger, and they accuse God of being an ogre. And they say, Calvinism is heresy. And you've got to say, what on earth are you saying? That God would choose any one of us as such an act of love. God's not mean and an ogre. He's chosen to love us. All he did was go into the orphanage of the world. In the Old Testament, he chose a nation. In the New Testament, he chose a bride. That's the church. People here and there. And then we turn around and say, God, that's so mean. Why, we, why do we do that? It's not right. God selected unlovable people and chose to love them in spite of their unlovability. He continues here, look at verse 3. He says, I've hated Esau, and I've made his mountains a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. That's what God did to Esau and his descendants, Edom. And as Malachi presented this message, Israel needed to consider this. Israel needed to realize what their lot might have been like if God had treated them like he treated Esau. That's the whole point. He's saying, Israel, if you had been Esau, then this is what would have happened to you. You would have been a desolation, living in a wilderness, a scavenger's existence. Do you ever think about what your life would have been like if you hadn't got saved? That's the point. Imagine that Christ didn't invade your heart and your soul, change your mind, and draw you to himself. Imagine if he didn't do that. What would your life be like? We, we were driving home last night, and uh, there's these three youths on the road. They were drunk, and they were, they were just on the road, just in the way of the cars, and we slowly tried to get past, and one of them came over and like knocked, knocked on the car, and, and I'm thinking, they're out of the world. I'm out of the, they're drunk, they don't know what they're doing, and I'm thinking, that would have been my life if it wasn't for God's grace. Do you ever think about that? What would your life be like without Christ? And that's exactly what God is doing with Israel. He's saying, imagine Israel if you were, were Esau. If you were were Edom and living as a desolation and void of my love and void of my care, imagine that. That thought should generate all kinds of thankfulness in our hearts. It really should. But look at how Edom responds. Look at this. Number four, Edom's defiance. Edom's defiance. Edom says, we've been beaten down but we will return and build up the ruins. That was their response. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. And they knew their Old Testament history just like Israel. They knew that their father was Esau. They knew that God had chosen Jacob and not them. They knew that. But they didn't care. They said, We're going to be a great nation anyway. We're going to build up the ruins. They didn't care what God said about them. They're going to make it on their own. They they figured we don't need God's blessing. 
We don't need God's care. We can make it on our own. So they set for themselves independent and self-glorifying goals to rebuild. They were going to be a mighty and powerful nation no matter what God said. But look at God's determination. This is God's response. This is what he said to them. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Edom may build, but I will what? I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant. For how long? Forever. In other words, Edom can try all they like. They can try to build, they can try to make their massive plans, but in the end, after they've pursued riches and power and and they've lined their pockets and tried to secure their comfort, in the end, I am going to tear them down. That's God's determination. And instead of living in the Holy Land, where are they going to live? In the wicked territory. It's a play on words. They're going to live in Sin City. That's where they'll live. Never to rise to prominence because the Lord is angry with this nation. This is God's righteous determination for sinners. It's what sinners deserve. It's appropriate. It's just. It's the right conclusion for those who are born in sin. And here's the point. That would be the right conclusion for you and I too. It just is. That would be our lot in life if it wasn't for God's love. Amen? He's been so good to us. And so God says he's going to treat Edom just as they deserve. And and then finally, look at verse 5. Here's Israel's response. We'll call this Israel's deliverance. Israel's deliverance. Verse 5. God says, Israel, your eyes will see this. In other words, you will see my treatment of Edom. You'll see that. And you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. This is the Lord's promise to the nation of Israel. He, He says, even though... Even though right now, Israel, your heart is far from me, and even though right now you're apathetic and you're this little child slapping me across the face, even though right now you don't understand how much I've loved on you, one day I'm still going to deliver you. That's his point. A day will come when instead of questioning my love, you're going to say, the Lord be magnified in the whole earth. And Israel's response will be totally different. It's a great text of Scripture. What I want to do is take the rest of our time and bring this full circle to us. Is that okay? So contemporary application. So how, how does this apply to us? And uh, I've got nine implications for you. It sounds like a lot, but they'll go quickly, okay? So uh, applications for us, nine of them. How do we assimilate this into our lives. Here we go. And in the notes, you can fill in the gaps again. Number one, when you don't see yourself as very bad, you cannot see God as very good. If you don't see God as very bad, sorry, if you don't see yourself as very bad, you cannot see God as very good. In other words, spiritual pride will kill us. Does that make sense? If we are spiritually prideful, it's going to kill us. Attitudes of self-righteousness and entitlement and self-centeredness make it absolutely impossible to see that God is actually good. People think that God's just like them. We do it all the time. and We we see it in people. They they call themselves Christians, and, and yet when God disciplines them, they don't like it. And they call themselves Christians, but they don't fear God's righteousness or obey obey His instructions. And when trials come, they get angry with God instead of being thankful to God for His goodness. And the reason is because they failed to acknowledge their own rank, rotten, rancid depravity. We need to see ourselves accurately, don't we? That's the beginning of the Christian life. We, we are so sinful, we deserve hell. That's the point. 
We deserve hell. And so for us then, any day not in hell is a really good day. It just is. Any day not in hell is a great day. And I'm not even trying to be cliche. It's just a truth that we need to embrace. Uh, if you listen to psychology, they, the psychology, uh, psychologists will tell us that we are good people. Uh, we're good people trying to find ourselves, be honest to ourselves. The Bible does not agree with that at all. The Bible says we are bad people who are trying and we should be like someone else, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. So we need to humble ourselves and see ourselves from God's perspective. Then we will see just how good he's been to us. Number two, number two, when we see the terrible plight of sinners, we should be driven to appreciate God's love for us. When we see the terrible plight of sinners, we should be driven to appreciate God's love for us. Uh, some of you have siblings, a brother or a sister or another family member who's not a believer. And, um, and you see them, they, they've walked away from Christ. They, they're, they're walking towards sin. They're making a mess of their lives. And then you realize, like, wait, I had the same parents. We had the same... Um, opportunity to hear the gospel, we were exposed to the same truths, and yet they're walking away from Christ, and I somehow was chosen by God to be one of his children. How can that be? So we compare our lives with the plight of someone else who was exposed to the same opportunity, and all we can do is say, thank you, Lord, right? Because we were the same. Same opportunity, God chose us and chose not to choose them. Number three, number three, God does not owe us. <laughs> God doesn't owe us. God does not owe you anything. He's not promised us trouble-free lives. Listen, if all we receive from God is His friendship and forgiveness, then we're in a pretty good place. It's all we need. His friendship and His forgiveness. Don't need anything else. But the problem is, I think sometimes we buy in, subconsciously it happens, we buy into the health, wealth, and prosperity mentality of the charismatics. We buy into that. And we think that somehow God is expected to improve our lives, to give us more security, to, to, to allow the money resources to grow, and comfort levels should grow, and relationships should improve, and... Sometimes even we, we're tempted to think that health should be okay, guaranteed. But God doesn't owe us those things. He didn't give them to Jesus. Right? So why should he give them to us? Listen, any day not in hell is a really good day. We need to believe that. I, was, I met a, a guy a while back, uh, he was ah, 20 years old, and he came to me because he had some problems. He, uh, he said, you know, Nigel, I've got some problems. He said, tell me about it. And uh, he said, you know, I started working, and uh, I have to get up at 6.30 in the morning to go to work. That's what he said. <laughs> Can you believe this? I said, tell me more. <laughs> he said, and when I get to work, there's this guy, my boss, who thinks he can tell me what to do. I'm like, you've got to be joking. You know what I said to him? I said, suck it up, dude. Welcome to normal life. <laughs> it wasn't my best counseling moment, I admit. <laughs> Maybe you would have said the same thing though, right? I said, what happens is we get so used to this idea that God owes us, and when life doesn't turn out the way we want it, then we get angry. We all succumb to this at some time of our lives, but God doesn't owe us anything. Number four, ingratitude always leads to disobedience. Ingratitude always leads to disobedience. If you're not thankful to God, you won't obey Him. That's the point. In fact, if you read through the rest of Malachi, 
you'd see Israel failed in multiple areas of disobedience. Why? Because they weren't thankful to God. They just weren't. When thankfulness drops away, disobedience begins. Number five. In the same way, a parent absorbs the unkind words of ungrateful children, so too does God absorb our sins in order to maintain relationship with us. Parents, in those moments, and I know it probably didn't happen often, but in those moments when your child said to you, I hate you, Mom, I hate you, Dad, what was your response? Well, I hate you too. Did you say that? You don't say that, right? Maybe you're tempted to. (laughs) But you don't say that because parents want to maintain a relationship with children so much, they love them so much that they absorb the sins of the children. Get it? God does exactly the same with us. We sin and we sin and we sin and God absorbs and absorbs and absorbs in order to love on us. Isn't that good? He forgives over and over again. He's such a loving God. Number six, if you're a Christian, be overwhelmed and humbled by predestination. Yeah. Be humbled by predestination. God didn't have to choose you. Didn't have to choose me. Just didn't have to. Could have chosen someone else. But we have been adopted by God. He adopted us when we were bad. We didn't choose him. He chose us. That is love. Predestination should amaze us, not make us angry. I don't know why people are so upset by election. No one comes to me and says, Nigel, you're so mean. Nigel, you only chose one wife. They don't say that to me. They don't say, Nigel, think about all those other women in the world. They're missing out on your love, Nigel. (laughs) They deserve your love too, Nigel. And you're choosing not to give it to them like you give it to Serena. People don't say that to me, and yet they dare to say that to God when all he's done is chosen a bride for himself. The same thing. doesn't make any sense. Predestination should humble us. It should amaze us, not make us angry. Number seven, when trials come, embrace them as the kind gift of a loving God. Embrace them. Now, this is challenging. It was challenging for all of us. God lovingly brings trials to grow us. Do you you understand that? He brings trials into our lives to make us more like Christ. So, why on earth are we running away from them? Don't run away from trials. Embrace the trials and learn everything that God wants you to learn from them. It goes like this. My wife is like a dripping tap. But Lord, thank you that you're teaching me how to display the fruit of the Spirit in my life. My wife's words are good for me. Thank you, Lord. That's the attitude to have. My husband ignores me. But thank you, Lord, that I get to love my husband in your strength, even though he doesn't see it. I'm learning to live my life for you, God, and not for the attention of a man. Thank you, God, you're so kind to give me my husband. That's the right attitude. That's embracing the trial. My boss just let me go. Thank you, Lord, that you're teaching me to trust you, Lord, and not earthly resources. My car just broke down. Thank you, Lord, for my broken down bomb. It's way better than hell. (laughs) Just is. You're so kind because you saved me from damnation and gave me this bomb instead. That's a good trade. My parents beat me up when I was young. Thank you, God, that I get to learn that you are my loving father. And now I get to forgive others just like you forgave me. 
I'm being persecuted. Thank you, Lord, that I have the extreme privilege of suffering for the gospel's sake. There's nothing better in the world. You're so good to me. You love me. And being persecuted for Christ's sake is a blessing. My friends have abandoned me. Thank you, God, for unfaithful friends. Thank you that I get to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Jesus' friends were unfaithful to him. And now I get to experience the same thing. Lord, you're so kind to me. Well, my child has cancer. Thank you, God, that in spite of the physical effects of the fall, I have this opportunity now to consider the realities of eternity and to prepare for the end of life. Thank you for this trial. Thank you, God, that you love me so much that you brought cancer into this home. It's tough stuff, right? I was hanging out with a guy back in our church. He's 21 years old. He was really fit. He's a buff guy. He was going into the Marines. That was his plan. And um, just over a year ago, he had a car accident. He uh, skid off the road, car flipped over, had brain injury. Went to see him in the hospital, and, and uh, the brain injury affected his, his, whole, his whole faculties, just everything. He couldn't move the same. And so, in the months that came after that, he was just trying to learn how to walk. His speech was slurred, he couldn't drive. His whole plan is changed. Like, he's, he will never go into the Marines now. Now, he could have just as easily turned bitter, right? But you know what he does? He's 21 years old. And he says, you know, Nigel, I'm so thankful because if it wasn't for that accident, I would still be pursuing a life of sin. But God woke me up from my sinful lifestyle and has saved me, and now I'm going to live for him, regardless of my physical state. That's the kind of attitude that we should have. You embrace the trial instead of running from it. I, you know, I think what happens is some of this grates with us. And we talk about these things as if it's so easy. I'm not saying it's easy. It's difficult to do. But if someone says, well, I just can't live that way. I don't want to live that way. Then it's hard to be settled that their faith is real. I don't know. How, how can you trust God for salvation and then not for the, for the smaller things in life? It doesn't make any sense. God is sovereign. He plans everything for our good and for his glory. So embrace the trials. Does that make sense? What a challenge. Number eight, two to go. Almost there. Uh, number eight, God expects us to change our attitude even, even if he doesn't change our circumstances. This is what Israel's doing in Malachi's day. They're saying, God, you change our circumstances and then we will acknowledge your love for us. Oh, no, 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 no. We change our attitude before God changes our circumstances. What a heartbreak for God that must have been. He, he loved them to the hilt, and they, all, all they have for him is a selfish demand for more. Boy, we need to change our attitude. Number nine, Christians are not those who claim Christ simply to escape hell. True Christians are broken people who hate their own sin, dream of being holy, and trust Christ in order to be transformed. Listen, if all Christianity is to you is a way to avoid hell, then you're not a Christian. If that's all it means to you, just a way to not go to hell, then you don't know God. You don't know Jesus Christ. True Christians are those who hate their sin. They can't stand their fleshly desires. They want to change. They're desperate for change. And so they're asking God to bring change into their life. Make me more like Jesus. They want to be born again. They want to be righteous. Listen, if you love your sin and you plan your sin out in advance, then you're not someone who hates sin. You've got secret sin. And your religious life is all about 
keeping up appearances. And then you think that one day when you meet God, that God will overlook all of that. You've got another thing coming. It doesn't work that way. True believers love Christ and want to follow him no matter what. One last thought. Genuine Christians, they lay down their lives daily, and when the trials come, they say, thank you, God. Thank you. You are so kind to me. You are treating me way better than I deserve. That's what they say. You have loved me, and I'm never going to think otherwise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage, other passages like it that just give us a dose of reality. They help us to see ourselves from your perspective. They help us to see ourselves with a clear vision so that we can reflect and just even reevaluate just where we stand before you. Lord, help us to learn these lessons. We want to trust you. We want our faith to be real. We want to be those that would respond to you in gratitude. So, Lord, help us not to be like the typical millennial who always wants more, but that we, we would live life full of faith, trusting you for the good times and the hard times.